Back in October of 2015, I was just reading about the news. Then suddenly, a random thought came into my head. Who are the most and least popular governors in the United States right now? I can't speak for why that thought came into my head, but it did. And fortunately, Ballotpedia had just started to track the favorability ratings of governors in the USA. I will put on screen the image that I saw at the time. Now, what interested me particularly was the absolute lowest approval rating, Governor Sam Brownback with an approval rating of 26%. Yes, 26%. And I was thinking to myself, how the heck do you get an approval rating that low? Like, you have to try to get an approval rating that low. Like, at the time, I was living in Jersey. We, you know, we had Chris Christie who was dealing with his own crap, like with Bridgegate and whatnot. But even then, he, his approval rating was still at around a 40%, not a 26%. So I did some research and I discovered... Well, I discovered what is known as the Kansas Experiment. The Kansas Experiment is the nickname given to some sort of bill in the Kansas state legislature, laws, whatever the kids are calling it, where basically they slashed taxes to such an inordinate degree that it really fucked with Kansas's economy. Now... Kansas does have a long history of being, you know, a relatively low tax state. They like being self-reliant, that sort of thing. The Kansas experiment took that to way high new levels. And one thing I realized is if I go on YouTube and try to look into the Kansas experiment, you don't find much. So I guess I'll start my own series on the Kansas experiment if I can find some extra stuff to read about it. First thing that I will be reading is an article aptly titled The Kansas Experiment, from August 5th, 2015, by Chris uh, Swillentrop from the New York Times. Personally, I wish the New York Times would make this themselves. They are the owners of Autumn. However, they didn't, so I guess I'll do it. Now, let's get into the article. When I think of my Uncle Gene, I think of a man who, late into the night, at a particularly boisterous family wedding, would flatten his palms against the dance floor, extend his body parallel <clears throat> to the ground, and then begin to undulate his legs and torso in a move known as the worm. Or I think of how, even later that same evening, he would agitate for a midnight meal at a diner in West Wichita, Kansas, called the Golden Bell. Or how, in his more abstemious workday life, he left the family business, a small bank based in Colwich, a town of about a thousand people in South Central Kansas, where he grew up alongside my father and 11 other siblings, so that he could expand a chain of pizzerias, which grew to include 48 franchises in five states. But when you think of Jean Solentrop, and you do think of him even if you don't know it yet, you might regard him as a blight on the Republic. He's a partisan political warrior which is a social type whose popularity probably ranks somewhere just above that of journalists, even for those who share his deeply conservative fiscal politics. And if you're a liberal, coastal cosmopolitan sort, at best you probably see him as a deluded, if well-intentioned peddler of what the New York Times op-ed columnist Paul Krugman has called, quote, right-wing derp of doctrines that just get repeated and indeed strengthen their political hold no matter how wrong they prove." End quote. Maybe you think my uncle Gene is an ideologue, or maybe that's another word for idealist. Gene is 63 now, and his worm dancing days are well behind him. He has served in the Kansas legislature for the past six years, the last four as an ally of Governor Sam Brownback, who is best known for his crusading social conservatism including an unwavering opposition to abortion rights and same-sex marriage. Yet as governor, Brownback's fiscal politics may be more remarkable. In keeping with the state motto, Ad Astra Per Aspera, or To the Stars Through Difficulties, Kansas politics have always been touched with a spirit of the avant-garde and the unorthodox, from popular sovereignty to prohibition and beyond. 
Today, thanks in large part to Brownback, the state is a petri dish for movement conservatism, a window into how the National Republican Party might govern if the opposition vanished. The 125 legislators of the House of Representatives include 97 Republicans. The Senate has an even greater percentage of Republicans, with only 8 Democrats among the 40 Senators. With Brownback as governor, Kansas is in the midst of a self-described economic quote-unquote experiment, a project that, whatever you think of its merits, is one of the boldest and most ambitious agendas undertaken by any politician in America. Brownback calls it the March to Zero, an attempt to wean his state's government off the revenues of income taxes and to transition to a government that is financed entirely by what he calls consumption taxes, that is, sales taxes and, to a lesser extent, property taxes. This fervor of budget cutting is hardly unique to Kansas. At the federal level, the opposition party in the White House has kept the Republican majority in Congress from making much headway. But there are 23 states in the Union controlled entirely by Republicans, from State House to Governor's Mansion. 24, if you count Nebraska's technically nonpartisan unicameral legislature, compared with just six, and Washington, D.C., on the Democratic side. In these Republican states, the combination of the Great Recession with the anti-Obama elections of 2010 and 2014 has allowed legislators to make deeper cuts to the size and scope of government than has been possible in Washington for decades. In 2012, according to a report by the Pew Charitable Trusts, state government spent $9 billion less than they did the previous year, the first such decline in 50 years. Many of those cuts have fallen on education. In Pennsylvania, for example, Governor Tom Corbett cut funding for the state's public universities by 20%, a compromise from his original proposal of 50%. Last month in Wisconsin, Governor Scott Walker, backed by Republican majorities in the state House and Senate, cut $250 million from the University of Wisconsin system. As many tax-cutting states have found later on, the party's deep-seated opposition to tax increases of any kind can make balancing the budget a high-wire act. In Alabama this year, the state's Republican governor, Robert Bentley, vetoed a bill from the Republican-controlled State House that would have removed $200 million from the state's budget, including 5% cuts for Medicaid, prisons, and the state's Department of Mental Health. Instead, he called the legislature into a special section and asked for more than $300 million in new taxes. The situation in Kansas was just as dire, if not more so. Brownback began the year by cutting education in the face of the state's budget crisis, but he also proposed that legislators raise taxes on cigarettes and alcohol. The new taxes were part of an effort to close a staggering gap for fiscal year 2016, estimated at $650 million in January, or more than 10% of the state's $6 billion general fund. More urgent, the state still needed to cut about $300 million from this year's budget as, month after month, tax revenues continued to arrive well below expectations. In January alone, the state took in $47 million less than anticipated. As Brownback saw it, these new taxes on consumption were necessary so that his priority, the March to Zero Income Taxes, could proceed. Uncle Gene is not an architect of the March to Zero, but he supports it, and he's one of the legislators in the Kansas State House who has helped to enact it and to preserve it. He is the vice chairman of the Tax Committee in the Kansas House, and he also sits on the Appropriations Committee. There are more important figures, the Speaker of the House, the Senate President, the leaders of the Tax and Appropriations Committees in both houses, for starters, in the State House. But Gene is in the next tier. He's one of the people whose support the governor usually relies on to get something done, according to Tim Schallenberger, Brownback's legislative liaison and former speaker of the Kansas House. I called Gene in January, as this year's legislative session began in Topeka. For a Kansan and a Swellentrop, Gene is a talker. But if you met him, you'd probably find him a little bit reserved, although not taciturn. On this call, he sounded worried. People are leaving Kansas, he told me. The state has no mountains and no beaches and thousands of jobs that were lost during the Great Recession, especially in Wichita's aircraft industry, never returned. The March to Zero, which includes an already passed provision that exempts the owners of 330,000 businesses and farms in Kansas from income tax, was designed, Gene said, to turn Kansas into a different sort of tourist attraction. As he and his fellow conservatives see it, it's an open for business sign. One they hope will draw free enterprise to the state, perhaps akin to the way the national debate over the expansion of slavery once drew young abolitionists from New England to the plains. At the very least, they hope it will prevent young people and existing businesses from moving elsewhere to places with ski lodges or surf shops. 
A couple of weeks later, I landed at the airport in Kansas City, Missouri, and drove an hour or so west to Topeka, where Gene offered to be a sort of Virgil on my tour. He would introduce me to the principles in the state's budget negotiations in the hope of highlighting what he called, quote, a different philosophy of how to make a state's government revenues match its expenditures. I've spent much of my life moving between America's two political territories, between places like Topeka and places like Washington, Boston, and New York, and generally found that neither knows much about the other beyond caricature. For my part, I hope to be able to reveal Gene and his colleagues as something other than the monolith of monsters and morons that they are so often taken for in the political conversation. Perhaps out of disregard for the moral disagreements that underlie the American political divide. When you report for the New York Times, you're sometimes told never to forget that your last name is, quote unquote, of the New York Times. Topeka may be the only place I've covered where my birth name opened more doors than my professional surname. Welcome home, Gene said, when I met him during the first week of February as the state was struggling even to find the cash to pay its bills that month. The next day I encountered Mark Dugan, Brownback's campaign manager during a tough re-election fight in 2014, a victory that conservatives perceive as a referendum on and a mandate for the march to zero. And he stretched out his hand and said, great to meet you, cuz. Dugan is now a lobbyist for, among others, the anti-tax organization, the Club for Growth. He and I had never met, but our families are close and our grandmothers are sisters. During a meeting that week with Susan Wagle, the Senate president, she smiled and said, You've gotten around pretty well with that last name. When I protested that I was on assignment for the newspaper of record, she looked around at her staff and asked, Would we have had time for someone who didn't have the last name Sullentrop? There were actually five Sullentrops roaming the state house on my third day in Topeka. Me, Jean, my father, and my uncle Charlie, both of whom drove in from the Kansas suburbs of Kansas City to visit, and my Uncle Frank, the president of the family bank who came up from Wichita for a gathering of the Kansas Bankers Association, which Brownback addressed. As I pondered whether we should start a lobby, Charlie, who works as a corrections officer, began volunteering political advice. You've got to get out there that you're not anti-teacher, he told Gene, referring to the plan to reduce a court-imposed spending increase on education. I know you're not, but that's what they're going to say, he added. Two teachers live right behind me, and my god, they just hate Brownback. As a child and as a young adult, I always found Gene to be an affable, if extremely opinionated guy. Uncle Gene in Topeka was not all that different from Uncle Gene in Colwich, although perhaps he had less hair. Even in his 60s, he cuts a boyish, blue-eyed, baby-faced figure in the statehouse. He's far from flashy. But he has been known to depart from the monochromatic navy suits that dominate Topeka as they do in Washington. He speaks in a slow baritone, not the reedy twang of many rural Kansans. I followed him for a few days in February as he mixed with legislators and lobbyists. This is one of our business-friendly legislators, a Walmart lobbyist said as he clapped Gene on the back. He gets it. Free market guy. Walmart is not always popular in western Kansas, where even some conservatives blame it for hollowing out small towns by putting small grocers and others out of business. A lobbyist for McLean, a subsidiary of Warren Buffett's Berkshire Hathaway, fretted about the effect of higher cigarette taxes on company-owned convenience stores along the Missouri border. Gene brainstormed with Dave Trabert, the president of the Small Government Kansas Policy Institute, about whether there was a way to isolate the administrative costs in the state's education budget so Republicans could cut them without reducing classroom spending. My uncle would stiffen a little, though, if local reporters approached. He gave direct but clipped answers to their questions. On the morning my father and Uncle Charlie were in town, we ran into Topeka's most powerful figure, who presides over the state houses like a school principal. Sam Brownback favors sweater vests and ties and can be found sipping from a coffee mug under the rotunda, as he was this day near a ring of the eight ruling flags that have variously flown over Kansas going back to the 15th century. He is modest in demeanor, flat almost to the point of dullness. This explains why the New Republic once described him as quote-unquote diminutive, even though his height approaches six feet. When I met him a month later at Cedar Crest, the governor's residence in Topeka, he served me tangerines that he peeled and set out on a Toy Story 2 plate. His affect makes him easy to underestimate, 
In the past four years, Brownback has remade the Kansas Republican Party in his likeness. The party's once powerful moderate wing has withered after steep losses in consecutive primary elections, the main battleground where policy is determined in a one-party state. In 2011, the Kansas House welcomed 33 new Republican members, and then 40 more in 2013, a turnover of more than half the body in just a few years. The Senate's moderate Republican president, Steve Morris, was ousted in 2012 with Brownback's support. It has been a striking transformation for a state party long associated with a more cooperative approach to politics. Bob Dole, who after Dwight Eisenhower is the most revered politician in Kansas, told Al Hunt of Bloomberg View this spring that his proudest political accomplishments were passing the Americans with Disabilities Act and brokering a 1983 compromise to rescue Social Security through benefit cuts and tax increases. Brownback takes great pride in the bipartisan humanitarian agenda he pursued as a United States Senator. He and Barack Obama once wrote an op-ed for the Washington Post criticizing the Bush administration's policies in Darfur. But it is impossible to imagine him trumpeting, as Dole did, entitlements and regulations as his political legacy. That day, Brownback was stewing over a basketball loss his undergraduate alma mater, the Kansas State Wildcats, had suffered against the Kansas Jayhawks, the more popular, more successful, more glamorous team in the state. It just went according to script, he complained, and it was slow and boring to boot. My dad chimed in that K-State liked to play that way, a tough, physical, not always aesthetically pleasing style. Brownback nodded. It was clear that he preferred to be the scrapper. When you're fighting a gazelle, he said, the best thing to do is to step on her foot. The one constitutional requirement of the Kansas legislature, as everyone in Topeka will tell you, is to produce a balanced budget. The legislature arrives in January each year, works for 90 days, give or take, and then essentially goes home until next year. Lawmakers earn roughly $18,000 for the session, although much of that is allotted for gas and hotel rooms. The budget itself, at least in broad strokes, is not a complicated document. About half of the state's spending goes to K-12 education, with another 12% or so given to the state's public colleges. Around 20% goes to Medicaid, some more go to pensions for teachers and state workers. Add those numbers up and you get a budget that's relatively inflexible, even for a governor and legislature eager to cut it. But the details, especially when facing a sizable deficit and no easy new cuts in spending, the process can get technical. Here in Topeka, the biggest question at the outset of the 2015 legislative session, after, you know, can Kansas pay its bills, was whether Brownback could preserve one of the most controversial elements of his 2012 tax cut, the zero income tax policy for the owners of businesses structured as quote unquote pass-through entities, mostly S corporations and limited liability corporations. Brownback calls this the Small Business Accelerator and was conceived in consultation with Arthur Laffer, the Reagan-era economist and godfather of supply-side economics. Government revenues plummeted. In fiscal year 2014, which ended about a year ago, Kansas took in almost $330 million less than it had anticipated, almost 6% below the estimates of the state's nonpartisan experts. According to Pew, at the end of 2014, only five states had experienced declines in tax revenues for three consecutive quarters. Alaska, Connecticut, North Carolina, Wisconsin, and Kansas. Moody's cut its debt rating for Kansas in April of last year. It's like going through surgery, Brownback told the Wall Street Journal at the time. It takes a while to heal and get growing afterwards. Brownback's devotion to his tax cuts would make it difficult, if not impossible, for him to live up to a second goal he had set for his administration, increasing spending on education. If tax revenue was going to continue to fall, the budget for K-12, as everyone referred to it as if it were a mountain in the Himalayas, would have to fall a little too. Tim Schallenberger, sounding a lot like Rahm Emanuel after Barack Obama's election in 2008, told me that the budget crisis in Kansas created an opportunity for conservatives to repeal the state's school finance formula, which he called the last still-standing democratic achievement in the state. Brownback himself, mixing metaphors, said it was the key to the Rubik's Cube that will solve it. As he put it during an interview in his office in the State House, major on the majors, not on the minors. In early March, the results of the backroom negotiations over school financing 
were announced at a news conference by the leaders of the budget committees for the House and Senate. The plan essentially froze spending for school districts for the next two years while loosening the rules for how districts could spend what money they did get. It repealed the formula that the state had used for more than two decades to allocate money to districts, which was based on enrollment, property values, the number of special needs students, and other factors. Republicans pledged to create a new formula, one that emphasized outcomes and student achievement over quote-unquote suburbans for superintendents. Suburban driving superintendents being, in Kansas at least, the 21st century equivalent of Ronald Reagan's Cadillac driving welfare queens. But they gave themselves two years to figure it out. A week after the news conference, the bill was passed on the floor of the House, and within 12 days it was the law of the land. Putting aside the merits of the formula, or exactly how many dollars each school district needs, the vote was significant because, despite being a Republican achievement, it effectively guaranteed that the legislature would need to raise taxes before the session was over. The House and Senate, before repealing the formula, restored tens of millions of dollars in cuts that Brownback had taken from schools in February. Just holding education spending nearly flat required extraordinary measures in the House where the vote fell one shy of the 63 needed to pass the bill. This led to a call of the House, a motion that requires each legislator to remain seated while state troopers, at least supposedly, scour the state for missing members. Two hours later, a couple of members of the House showed up and voted yes, and the call was lifted. The bill cut roughly $50 million from schools, a figure that conservatives asserted could be made up by consolidating administration and back-end operations like payroll, especially in the smaller districts. Critics of the cuts described them in apocalyptic language as the dismantling of public education in Kansas. Mark Tallman, a lobbyist for the state's association of school boards, told me both sides were telling the truth. Schools would be getting more money than they received in 2014. but. That accounting relied on a contentious tactic, lumping the teacher pensions, previously a separate item, with each school district's budgets. Those pensions may reflect the full cost of employing a teacher, and thus be fairly considered a classroom expense, but making that determination while holding the line on spending could dent school operating budgets. Also, on a practical level, the legislators had clawed back money that the districts expected to receive and had already allocated for this year. Won't even supporters of smaller government, I asked several conservative leaders in Topeka, complain when jobs in their communities are lost? Wagle, the Senate president, smiled and said dryly, There will be lots of complaints. Ty Masterson, the chairman of the Senate Ways and Means Committee, said districts needed to ask themselves, Am I holding this position because I need this position? Or am I holding this position because I want to employ this person? Gene put it this way, well, how much government do you want? That same week, I went to see Brownback at Cedar Crest, the governor's residence, days before the Kansas Jayhawks and Wichita State Shockers were to play each other in the NCAA men's basketball tournament. He was in a playful mood. Did you get tickets to Omaha, he asked. Your dad couldn't get that for you? Your uncle's Gene, come on! Lucy, his three-year-old puggle, wandered about. His foyer was littered with luggage and a backpack that his daughter had left there right before falling asleep upon her return from a Colorado ski trip. Brownback went into the kitchen, where the page-a-day scripture calendar was 12 days behind schedule, to get a drink and the tangerines. We sat in his cavernous living room beneath a Burger Sanzen landscape. He drank Coke from a Glory Days pizza souvenir cup and kicked his shoes off and left them by the fireplace. He was relaxed, close to man-spreading. A lot of people in the state house, I said, seem to be talking past one another during the education debate. Isn't it delightful, though, Brownback replied. After being at the federal level for so many years, you never had this sort of interaction. Because it's so big, it's so hard to change. You send up a trial balloon, you're likely to get killed with it yourself. But here, things just pop up all the time. One thing I liked, I said, was that there weren't a lot of staff members to deal with. Nothing against staff, I added, looking at Eileen Holly, Brownback's communications director, who was in the room with us. You're right, Brownback said. You're dealing with principals. That's why I like standing out in the hallways a lot of days. See who walks by, because I can do half a dozen meetings just standing there. Gene walks by with a tax idea, and I can say, You know, I'd have a real problem with that. No, not nothing against you. I just don't like this one. See the next guy on the education formula? Yeah, I really want to encourage you about that. I could do that all day long. 
You don't have to set up a meeting to go to a guy's office, have four people watching. You just deal with it right there in the hallway. The best part, he said, was simply that it functions, he said. You lack that functionality federally. The moderates and liberals probably don't think Topeka is all that functional, I pointed out. Well, maybe too functional, he said. When I met Ray Merrick, the white-haired, mustachioed speaker of the Kansas House, he handed me a copy of Ray's Rules, a document he gave to each Republican member of the House when he became speaker a couple of years ago. Emblazoned with an odd crest consisting of a bear in front of a maple leaf, Merrick was born in rural Alberta, beneath crossed rifles and above the Latin words, Rem publicam probare, which can be translated as examine the state, the diploma-like paper lists only two rules. Rule number one is to always ask yourself, are my efforts addressing job creation in the economy? Are they shrinking the size of our state government while providing essential services and expanding liberty? If not, why am I doing it? Why are we doing it? The second of Ray's two rules seemed especially relevant. It is our responsibility to be successful under conditions as we find them, not as we would like them to be. Brownback's dream of a state unburdened by income tax was not in itself unreasonable. Seven states, among them Florida, Nevada, and Texas, get by without one. But eliminating a tax that generates about 40% of your state's government revenue is a lot harder than never imposing that tax to begin with. An economic reality was failing to cooperate with the governor's expectations. Brownback, after signing the tax cuts in 2012, pledged they would act as, quote-unquote, a shot of adrenaline into the heart of the Kansas economy, a metaphor that called to mind an image of the governor astride a dying state like John Travolta atop Uma Thurman in Pulp Fiction, preparing to deliver a gleaming needle to the chest. In an op-ed article in the Wichita Eagle, Brownback made the cuts sound magical, suggesting they would create tens of thousands of new jobs, bring tens of thousands of new people to the state, leave more than $1 billion in the bank accounts of taxpayers, and even directly benefit our schools and local governments by expanding the population and economy. This money, or a good chunk of it, did stay in Kansans' pockets, but the rest of the promises have not been met, although Brownback points to the state's private sector job growth as evidence that his policies are working. I think it's just clear that the tax cuts were promoted as having these quick and strongly positive results, and they haven't, says Ramesh Ponuru, a senior editor at the National Review and native Kansan. He grew up about 10 miles from the house where I was raised in the suburbs of Kansas City. In late April, after the state's revenue estimate for the next fiscal year came in low, the Brownback administration and the state's legislative leaders crossed their fingers and hoped that there had been some unusually large checks dropped in the mail on April 15th. People who owe taxes tend to file on a deadline, they noted, while people who get refunds are more likely to file early. Eventually, the administration assigned additional staff members to start opening the piles of envelopes at the Revenue Department in search of the tax return equivalent of Willy Wonka's golden tickets. There's some discussions now about what the heck we're going to do for two weeks while they go through 160,000 envelopes, Gene told me by phone, audibly frustrated. I'll know a lot more Monday about what the next two weeks are going to look like, he said, adding, Sam's pretty upset about it. No golden ticket was ever found. The consensus estimate, as reported by the Lawrence Journal World, was that fiscal 2015 would bring in $5.7 billion in tax revenues, the lowest number since 2010's $5.2 billion, and $700 million less than the state collected in 2012 before the tax cuts were passed. Lawmakers and the governor would need to find about $400 million, it was announced, on April 20th to close the deficit for the fiscal year that would begin on July 1st in a little more than two months. Since the beginning of the legislative session, you could divide the conservative Republicans into three camps. The first was the Cutters, who thought that the state's budget woes would be solved solely through reductions in spending. These were the hardest of the hardliners, and their position did not get much consideration. The second was the Marchers, who were willing to raise sales taxes and other consumption taxes, but not to raise income taxes. The third I call the do-overs, who were willing to raise some taxes, but only if changes to the 2012 income tax cuts were included. The do-overs especially wanted to eliminate the zero tax policy for business owners and farmers. Each side brought numbers as evidence for the righteousness of its cause, but it was clear that they were motivated by something deeper, a reminder for an outsider like me who now lives in a very different political climate that math can never really resolve a debate rooted in history, culture, and values. 
In Kansas, the do-overs, who had many legislative leaders in their ranks, including Waggle, the Senate President, and Mark Hutton, the Chairman of the House Commerce Committee, wanted a system that valued fairness by taxing business owners and their employees equally. I hope I can get 63 people to put their integrity and fairness ahead of their desire to return here, Hutton told me. By contrast, the marchers led by Brownback, and including Uncle Gene, wanted a tax system that valued risk and entrepreneurialism. The two policies Brownback most wanted to preserve were his Small Business Accelerator and The Ratchet, a statute that automatically applies revenue growth in future years to income tax cuts before the money can be spent by legislators. Most of all, each side wanted to signal to themselves and to others that they stood for these things. <clears throat> At a moment when the divide between the do-overs and the marchers seemed unbridgeable, a public radio reporter asked Melissa Rooker, a moderate Republican, if conservatives were acting out of political expediency. No, Rooker said, these are true believers. If they were merely political opportunists, the gulf in Kansas and nationally would not be so wide. You could get around the political expediency, Rooker said. You could come up with different acceptable alternatives, but you can't change people's beliefs. In the second week of May, when the legislature was scheduled to finish the work for its supposedly 90-day session, tax proposals began whizzing through the two chambers with the speed of text messages or tweets. They began to be marked not just with dates, but also with timestamps to distinguish them from proposals that were rejected only minutes before. The negotiations began to resemble an effort to get 63 of the 97 Republicans to agree on what to put in a combo platter at a Mexican restaurant. An actual menu of 17 options was circulated by the House Tax Committee with price tags on each proposal. Raise the sales tax by one percentage point to 7.15% from 6.15%, and everyone could go home. It would bring in $426 million. Or raise it to 6.5% and make all business owners pay income taxes and impose Brownback's liquor taxes and you would get close to the same number. After the marchers and the do-overs on the House Committee failed to come up with a proposal that satisfied both sides, the two factions agreed to bring two separate bills to the House floor and let the whole Republican Party hash it out during a full debate with unlimited amendments. One bill was a consumption tax-only proposal that would test the depth of the support for the marcher perspective. The other would impose new income taxes at a reduced rate on otherwise exempt business owners among other increases. Soon, the wrangling turned to the question of which bill would go first. Gene wanted the do-overs to mount up and lead the charge. When their bill failed, they would resign themselves, he said, to the governor's approach. Instead, the marcher bill went to the floor of the house. It would be hard to find stronger circumstantial evidence that the congressional leadership had joined the do-over caucus. Mark Rhodes, a marcher leader, leveled just that accusation during the floor debate. The night before, as I walked out of the Capitol, I saw Mike O'Neill, a powerful marcher ally who was the Kansas Chamber of Commerce president and the Speaker of the House when the 2012 tax cuts passed. I asked him, this tax increase is going down in flames, right? I think so, he said. Unfortunately, that's the plan. The next morning, just before the debate ended and the votes were about to be cast, Gene approached the lectern in front of the Kansas House and spoke in favor of the bill. Food taxes will go down, he said. Income taxes will go down. The only one that is being increased is the sales tax, other than on food, he said. This bill will address the state's budget tax deficiency while maintaining our progression to cut rates for all. He sat down. Moments later, the bill failed on a voice vote so overwhelming that no one even bothered to ask for roll call. The Republican Party's seemingly intractable divide on taxes would continue for the next four weeks as the Kansas House and Senate tried to cobble together something, anything, that would get the votes, 63 in the House, 21 in the Senate, and one, the governor, to raise taxes and close the deficit. At one point, the Democratic leader of the Senate issued a news release that was nothing but a photograph of an underground passage and a single mocking sentence. There is no light at the end of the tunnel, because they can't even find the entrance to the tunnel. Finally, on June 11, Brownback made a personal appeal, a mixture of abashed pleading and brash threats. At a joint caucus of the House and Senate Republicans, the chandeliered old Supreme Court room on the Capitol's third floor, he said that he needed a tax increase by Monday, or he would have to balance the budget on his own, using his veto pen or his statutory authority to make the cuts himself. A line item veto of the entire operating budget for the state's six public universities, his budget director noted, would conveniently fill the hole. 
At 4 a.m. on June 12th, on the 113th day of the legislative session, after a debate that began at 1.30 in the morning and included one speech explaining a yes vote that was given in a staccato, shuddering sob, the House voted to raise taxes 63 to 45 with 17 not voting. The plan raised the state sales tax to 6.5% from 6.15%, estimated most itemized deductions for income taxes, raised cigarette taxes, and preserved a watered-down version of Brownback's ratchet. The Senate followed suit more than 12 hours later. Democrats called it the largest tax increase in Kansas history, passed without a single Democratic vote. Mark Hutton, the Committee on Commerce chairman and do-over leader, lashed out at moderates and Democrats who refused to vote for tax increases, either out of fear of losing their next election or out of a desire to campaign against Republicans for voting for them. He wrote in the Wichita Eagle after the session was over, In the end, we had a governor held hostage by East Coast ideologues who would not consider a correction to his tax policy, House moderates paralyzed by fear of being postcarded, Conservatives in both chambers who would have been fine with cutting 400 million from our state budget, and Democrats in both chambers who were more interested in political gains in the 2016 elections than being part of the solution in 2015. As an East Coaster, fuck you. Yeah, f fuck you. No, no, you don't get to fuck up your own state and, and then be like, oh, it's the fucking East Coast ideologues. No. Fuck you. You shat in your own bed. Now, you have to sleep in it. You can clean it up if you want. You can try to ignore it. But don't blame me for shitting in your bed. It was over. Sort of. The negotiator squeezed a final concession out of Brownback, an additional $50 million in unnamed budget cuts that would be made at the governor's discretion. Without those cuts, the budget that passed and was signed into law would leave an ending balance of little more than $30 million for fiscal 2016. Another bad January, and the state could be right back in the hole. Threatening the truce from another side is a lawsuit before the Kansas Supreme Court over whether the legislative's K-12 cuts were constitutional and satisfied the legal requirement to adequately and equitably educate Kansas children. In the coming weeks, school districts would announce layoffs and program cuts. A large suburban district said it would cancel its elementary school Spanish program. In Kansas City, just before the budget was passed, the superintendent announced a 10% cut to every school and department budget. NPR reported that Kansas teachers were fleeing to Missouri with twice as many unfilled teacher jobs in Kansas, 700 as there normally were at that time of year. The cuts to education were real and they have been the most controversial outcome of the budget agreement in Kansas. But I prefer to emphasize this aspect of the deal. A group of politicians decided to violate the deeply held principle to protect what they saw as the common good. In this summer of Trump, as the Republican presidential campaign reaches new nadirs of silliness, it may be hard for some to believe that conservatives in the Kansas State House could ever hit bottom on the amount of government that could be cut. But that's what's happened. If they could have cut spending more deeply without doing immeasurable harm to schools, to prisons, to mental hospitals, to roads, they would have done so. Over and over, they told me they didn't run for office to raise taxes. Then, they did exactly that. Not that Uncle Gene would necessarily see it my way. He held out hope that an audit of the government by a private firm, the money to pay for it is in the 2016 budget, would find new inefficiencies to eliminate. He would also point out that the new tax increases are smaller than the historic tax cuts of 2012. We wish to be known for an aggressive, positive business environment, he told me after the vote. Everyone else will say we're just flyover country, unless Kansas does something that makes people sit up and notice. To raise the sales tax by a little more than three-tenths of a percentage point is palatable, he said, if doing so would save the march to zero. And the dream of zero, at the end of the day, is what buoys him and his fellow travelers, no matter how arduous the journey ahead. Barring a surprise that is outside the control of Uncle Gene or the governor, an economic boom of the likes that is yet to be seen this century, filling the state's budget with a surplus of tax revenues that would make hard choices easy to avoid, Republicans in Kansas will almost certainly be debating again next January and perhaps for many Januaries to come, whether the march can keep moving to the stars through difficulties. 
There is one more thing that I wanted to add that I forgot to mention earlier, specifically about Sam Brownback. So, long story short, due to his extreme unpopularity, but also the fact that he became an avid Trump supporter, Trump didn't like the fact that, you know, one of his big boosters had, you know, the, an approval rating of like fucking 26%. So he basically kicked Brownback upstairs and nominated him to be the United States Ambassador at Large for International Religious Freedom. For all intents and purposes, like, I, I really can't seem to find out if they actually even do much. Like... Like, they work for the Office of International Religious Freedom. It, it was founded in 1999. I really... Like, for all intents and purposes, they seem to be almost a kind of puff position. Like, you are put in charge of a, of a, or an ambassadorship or something like that, but they don't seem to do much. Now, the reason I bring this up is because Brownback was so unpopular that... Okay, basically, th there was literally a tie in the Senate to appoint him to this role. Th there were, like, it was 49-49. A at this point, there were, like, what, 53 Republicans in the Senate? A and, and even a bunch of them were like, yeah, no, no, we're not going to appoint this guy to uh, what is effectively a puff position. So, like, literally, imagine being so unpopular that you get nominated to, you know, a cushy... Uh, basically, a cushy job where you don't have to do much, you get kicked upstairs, but you're so unpopular that not even members of your own party think you're worthy to be appointed to that job. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> like, how do you fail at that? I mean, seriously, just, just, the GOP could have just, you know, given him that position to be like, okay, good, get him out of our hair. No, they're like, nope, we're not even giving him that. He's not worthy of it. <laughs> You know, I may not accomplish as much as some of these men, but I'll never fuck up an entire state and then fail to be appointed to a puff position. <laughs> well, okay, technically not fail, but basically have to have the vice president break a tie, even though there are enough members of my own party to just push me through. <laughs> Hello, this is Fax Fivum, saying thank you for listening, and I sincerely hope that you enjoyed it. If you can, please like and share it around, and if you are feeling especially generous, please subscribe. I need at least 100 subscribers to change my YouTube channel's URL, and my default is long and ugly, and I really don't like it. It would be extremely helpful for me if you subscribed. But you don't have to. I'm not your boss. I'm just Fax Fivum. And right now, I'm signing off.